Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Well, you know, um, coming from Washington, D.C. as a Croatian diplomat in, in Washington, D.C., though, I would like to start tonight's discussion on my part with a quotation, a statement uh, from the joint statement that was issued by Presidents Medvedev and Obama on April 1st in London, when they jointly declared that they are ready to overcome the Cold War mentalities and uh, go ahead for a fresh start in uh, relations between the two countries. So since we're marking uh, 20, the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin War, uh, Wall on Monday, and actually at the end of the Cold War, we have to ask ourselves why 20 years later we're still talking about overcoming the Cold War mentality. Uh, in 1989, when President Bush, 41, visited Europe, he declared that he wanted to see Europe whole and at peace, and then the elements of that policy were threefold, as a matter of fact. That was engaging uh, Central and Eastern Europe and integrating it into the Euro-Atlantic institutions. So, uh, you know, taking that part of Europe into the Western fold. Secondly, it was uh, diffusing the crisis, especially in our region, in the Balkans, or as we prefer to call it in Croatia, Southeast Europe. And thirdly, it was a new relationship. It was engaging Russia. Um, I would say that the first two elements um, of that policy were successful, even um, though today, as Radna mentioned, we're still talking about unfinished business in Southeast Europe. And in addition to Kosovo, I would mention Bosnia and Herzegovina as well, we're certainly in Russia. The European Union and the United States will continue to play the role in, in, in further uh, constitutional changes. Uh, so um, the uh, NATO and EU enlargement help uh, Central and European countries on their way to democracy, uh, reforms, etc. However, it proved to be detrimental and even corrosive to this relationship with Russia. However, with President Obama, uh, with his statement and intentions of opening a new chapter and changing the whole atmosphere in the relationship with Russia, I think we have a new window of opportunity arising uh, in 2009. And that window of opportunity really has to be uh, used. And I would repeat what, what one of the colleagues already said, Russia has to be engaged. It has to be engaged uh, more forcefully in the discussion uh, in the context of NATO and Russia Cooperation Council. Uh, it has to be engaged um, in being involved in the new European security architecture. And there are a number of other areas where there is room for cooperation, such as counterterrorism, um, combating piracy, uh, arms control, especially the new agreement replacing um, START on arms control, um, cooperation in Afghanistan, um, Iran, North Korea, um, and of course, uh, trade, uh, economic cooperation, and investment. And uh, one needs to engage Russia and actually draw it with the, the power of uh, public diplomacy and self power in this um, world of interdependence today, so that, that the mutual relationship is not dependent, but rather interdependent, which then sets the preconditions for cooperation uh, between all the sides involved. Thank you. Uh, obviously, yes, uh, I would uh, say that the Cold War has uh, defined uh, Russian-American relations forever, but there was a, a phase of Cold War. And you know, some um, academics have already started writing about a new Cold War. I would disagree with that as well. I, I would agree that, yes, we cannot expect from President Obama to resolve everything. But I think that steps have been taken in the right direction. And with Hillary Clinton's visit to Moscow, uh, the fact that they made an agreement on a uh, bilateral presidential commission that is to identify areas of cooperation and actions needed um, and um, which includes comprises of about 16 different working uh, groups. Um, there is a potential, but you know, for every dialogue, there is also a need for two sides to engage frankly in that dialogue. Uh, when you look at Russia today, I will, I would not agree that Russia is in shambles. Yes, they've been through difficulties. They've seen, you know, the, the Soviet Union collapse. But Russia is a major world power, and they have legitimate security concerns. Some of us may disagree with the concerns they have that NATO enlargement towards Russian borders constitutes um, a, a threat to Russia. However, that is a perception that Russia has, and uh, most time perceptions in political life are a political reality. So obviously this is something that needs to be addressed seriously, seriously by President Obama, by the United States, 
by NATO and, and uh, the European allies of, uh, um, that are members of NATO. Uh, and on the other hand, again, Russia needs to seize this moment and again, frankly, uh, in these discussions, state their concerns and see how we can proceed and move forward. It's going to take years. I mean, there are going to be ups and downs, but I think that uh, on the part of the U.S. administration, there is this genuine desire to get things moving forward. Thank you. <laughs> just, just one brief comment. Uh, from the point of view of a country that's been negotiating its membership in the EU since October 2005, I can tell you that you, uh, the European Union is one big family. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, when it comes to disagreements um, over Kosovo, uh, they, I think they have been more uh, noticeable and, and, and more uh, pronounced in the Security Council rather than in the um, EU-Russia um, relationship, but simply because of the fact that the European Union is divided on the fact of recognizing Kosovo and how to proceed with the regional policy. And most of the discussion was in the UN Security Council. But, you know, the EU common policies, I, I, we are getting there in certain areas, but if you look at Russia policy, definitely there is a, a, not a single unified European position, again, on Russia and how to deal, how to proceed with, with Russia, even between the United States um, and uh, the European Union or individual members of the European Union. Ger Germany, for instance, has more of an economic state. It has invested heavily uh, into the Russian democracy in the economic, trade, and investment sense. Whereas the United States is more concerned about st strategic and geopolitical interests. So uh, in defining their policies toward, towards Russia, they always start off from these divergent interests. And I think this is precisely what's going to be happening with the European Union in trying to forge a common foreign and security policy on individual issues. Just a short comment from another neighbor. Uh, Croatia is not an immediate neighbor of Kosovo. However, we are neighbors with Serbia. And of course, we're in a very de delicate uh, position, the same as Macedonia. Uh, we uh, understand uh, the position of Serbia and the position of Belgrade. However, Kosovo was a new reality, uh, a new political reality that became recognized by a number of countries. Um, just uh, a few facts, because uh, the, the colleague who asked the question mentioned that it wasn't a viable state, etc. Uh, from the, the legal standpoint, Kosovo was part of the former Yugoslavia in the sense that it was an autonomous province um, in, the, in the Socialist Republic of Serbia. However, it did have its own borders, and it did have a representative in the collective presidency of the former Yugoslavia with the right to vote. And as far as viability is concerned, a lot of states have started out with international assistance. Again, Bosnia and Herzegovina is another example. And I think that Kosovo um, is on the way of stabilization, of building uh, its institutions and a civil society as well. And certainly it will be a player in Southeast Europe. I have a comment. I mean, um, personally, I must say I'm a very strong supporter of NATO. Uh, and I had a privilege, actually, of delivering uh, the instruments of ratification of our treaty and by which Action Croatia became member of NATO in April of this year. Um, I believe that NATO has uh, done a lot, especially for democracy in Central and Southeast Europe. Uh, NATO gave shape to the reforms uh, that are complementary with the process of EU accession. It has firmly set uh, human rights as the criteria for membership, um, and it paved the, paved the way for EU enlargement. It, was, it wasn't a rule, but it was a fact that basically countries apart from the neutral ones, such as Austria, they first became members of NATO before they became members of the European Union. And for a while, we thought that we were going to become members of the EU first, but it happened that we became members of NATO. Um, NATO is trying to redefine its role um, there was, uh, of course, a lot of um, a suspicion within Croatia as well within our own public for the purposes of NATO, what the, the, the benefits and uh, what the, the, the shortcomings would be. But I think what's most important is assuming responsibilities uh, for security, not just in our own neighborhood and in Europe, but um, on the global scene um, as well. I mean, NATO has started with humanitarian operations outside of the traditional Euro-Atlantic um, area and you know who knows what the future might hold. There is a, a panel of, of wise people who are trying to restructure um, the future and see where it will go. But I believe that there is a strong 
uh, future for NATO and we should cease to perceive it as um, an arm of the Cold War because it's proved that it has crossed the line that divided uh, Europe and that it has engaged very actively the new democracies and traditional processes and in taking this global responsibility. Thank you. Um, there is always a danger in personification of uh, policy in the sense of um, trying to make countries um, equal or looking um, at countries through the prism of people that they represent. I think that um, some statesmen have uh, made that mistake. For instance, I don't know, President Bush 41 looking at relations with Russia through his own relationship with uh, Gorbachev or Yeltsin later. Um, so the, there is always, you know, a much broader scope than just personalities. But I would like actually to leave some food for thought when it comes to uh, American-Russian or rather uh, European-Russian relationship. We often talk about um, energy dependence on Russia and the need for diversification of sources of energy, which of course um, is legitimate and what we all should be doing. But there's a, there are always two sides of a coin for every problem, and that's also for the European Union to consider. If you look at Germany, uh, Germany imports about 37% of its supplies of uh, oil from uh, Russia and 32% of gas or vice versa, I don't remember. But if you look at Russia itself, about 90% of its exports of oil and about 70% of its exports of gas go on the EU market. So Russia also has an interest to cooperate with the European Union and to work towards making this interdependence, which I mentioned earlier in, in, in one of the, the comments, rather than being uh, energy dependent. And the, the case is the same in many areas, but again, there are always two sides of the coin, and for dialogue, you need the two, the three, or, or more sides, and you need a cooperative engagement, and I hope that um, the times ahead of us will uh, show the prospects for such future. Thank you.